Hi, everybody. Um, I'm thrilled with the lineup we have today. This is a, an online event we've been wanting to run for a while. As some of you may know, um, O'Reilly runs one of these online conferences um, about four or five times a year, and uh, we get to explore different topics in more depth. Uh, today's topic is data that matters, and this is something I've been uh, passionate about and eager to get uh, on a lineup for quite a while because we hear a lot of stories about the evil side of big data, the slippery slope towards a big brother Orwellian world where our rights are invaded and our lives are no longer our own. But there are some amazing things that data can do to make the world a better place. You can shine the harsh light of data on corruption and expose wrongdoing. You can make uh, problems and atrocities visible at a scale that makes them impossible to ignore. Um, you have access to tons of information, and there are great initiatives to make that information open so it's not just available to the social networks and big organizations um, in whom we pour the contents of our lives, but also available to researchers and uh, NGOs and other organizations. And I'm thrilled to say uh, that we've got a great lineup of people today who are innovating in the world of information, uh, activists, innovators, uh, defenders of the commons, trying to make sure that the, the sum of human knowledge remains open, uh, that it is put to good uses, and that it is actually making change where it needs to be made the most. I'm going to get out of the way and let some of our extraordinary speakers uh, tell their stories to you themselves. Uh, we do have a great lineup. We're going to uh, start out with Christian Hammond from Narrative Science talking about uh, the stories that hide in data and how that can be, how stories can be surfaced across a wide range of uses. Uh, we're going to look at the Open Knowledge Foundation and how they're making tools to access data and keep it open. Uh, Jake Porway from Datakind is going to talk with um, some of his users who have worked with data scientists to try and make the world a better place where it's needed the most. Uh, Lisa Green is going to talk to us about crawling the web and making a copy of it so it's open. And then Diedrich Van Neer is going to talk about Wikimedia Foundation and how they go about keeping that information open and liberating it and analyzing that kind of stuff. So it should be a fascinating hour and a half. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Look forward to talking to you on Twitter and in the Q&A window. And now I'm going to hand things out over without further ado to Christian Hammond from Narrative Science. Christian. Uh, hi there, uh, Narrative Science, which is a, a for-profit organization. But uh, I'm here because uh, the nature of the Narrative Science technology is is really all about uh, taking uh, data uh, and making it uh, making it accessible. Uh, taking data and actually pulling out uh, the uh, intuitive in, uh, the intuitive analytics uh, and communicating them to people. Uh, the uh, the real problem uh, that we see with data. Uh, is that it's data, uh, and the uh, the reality is is that um, people don't need data. They need the insight and they need the understanding that really is uh, embedded in that data, and they need it pulled out and communicated in a way that uh, that people uh, can understand. And when I say people, I don't mean data scientists. I don't mean uh, people uh, who can do data analytics. I mean people who are decision makers, um, who are looking to make evidence-based decisions, but really don't have uh, either the time, the skills, or the expertise uh, to go into data, uh, uh, actually understand what those insights are, uh, and take actions on them. Um, and I'm just going to do a, a, a sort of walk through a, a simple example uh, in the uh, online education space. Um, uh, and uh, there, we're, we're, we're sort of faced with a world where um, uh, we have uh, a lot of people who are trying to, um, who are trying to um, uh, sort of uh, get an education uh, by uh, uh, going through uh, materials online and getting testing online, uh, and a tremendous amount of data is generated um, uh, by these people. Uh, and the question is, what do you do with it? Um, uh, and you can't really uh, show it to them in a way that I um, uh, can't really show it to them away in a spreadsheet or through uh, uh, data, you know, immediate data access uh, that is uh, completely intelligible to them um, in the whole. Um, and a lot of uh, a lot of organizations look at this and say, well, what we can do is we can personalize that data. Um, we can actually show them exactly what's going on with them, and we won't expose um, uh, we won't expose uh, uh, the uh, the data that um, you know one that 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 is for, that is associated with uh, other students. We'll just expose the data that's expo that's associated with this one this one student. Um, 
Uh, it's still data, though. Um, and you can show them a visualization and say, you know, here's how you've been doing uh, over time and here's how it compares to the mean. But it's still data. Uh, and you can, actually, uh, you can actually take that data um, uh, and uh, slice and dice it in a thousand different ways. Um, uh, uh, show them their scores, show them how their scores are, are changing over time. But the thing is, is that it's not, it's not in that form, it's not helping them uh, figure out what to do next, uh, how to respond to it. And even if you contextualize it, that is, show them uh, comparisons of how they've done against the, air, uh, against the uh, aggregate, um, it's still data. But the reality is, uh, and this is actually uh, a sanitized data that was associated with that's associated with one of our uh, one of our clients. Uh, the, the the reality is is that when somebody takes a test, um, uh, for every single question on that test, um, uh, we can know how hard that question was. Uh, we can know who else got that uh, question right or wrong. Um, we can know what that question was testing, and quite truthfully, for every single uh, wrong answer. Uh, we can know the type of error that was associated with it. Was it a, uh, a calculation error? Was it the misapplication of a formula? Um, and you have all of that data, and you certainly have it in the aggregate. You have it for the individual. But the question is, what do you then do with it? And what we do is the following. Um, we take that data, and we use it to create uh, reports. And those reports are aimed at the individual, uh, at the individual students. And they're not just reports that are aimed at um, um, giving them, you know, the, uh, uh, their, the raw scores or even that sort of what their ranking looks like. They're reports that are aimed at actually improving uh, their performance because we know what questions they got wrong. We know uh, who in their cohort got those questions right or wrong. We know how hard those questions were. And quite truthfully, we know exactly in the material um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the answer to that question is. Um, and if you take a look at that, uh, that, 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 that uh, outlined yellow area, here's the important thing that we can communicate. Here are some ways in which you can improve your scores. In physics, you should focus your studies on the sections dealing with magnetics and electrostatics. These are the topics on which you score the lowest. Your weakest area in chemistry is aldehydes and ketones. You consistently miss questions dealing with that topic. You also seem to have difficulty with the easier questions about nitrogen-containing compounds. Math is your strongest subject, but you still miss a lot of the more difficult questions. The topic of definite, uh, of definite integrals seems to catch you out the most often. And the notion here is that we can actually communicate to them not just how they're doing, uh, even in context, not just how they're doing. We can communicate to them what they need to do, what actions uh, they need to, uh, to take in order to improve their performance. Now, the thing is, is that um, we can transform um, that, that data into insight and to action. But really, this only works um, if you can do it at scale. That is, this is something where if you have a human in the loop doing it, they might be able to do it for one or two students. But if you're looking at thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of students, um, uh, to do it at scale, you actually need a computer. Um, and so that's what we do. Um, uh, we actually have uh, a core technology uh, that is aimed directly at the problem of taking data and transforming it into stories. Um, and I want to very briefly uh, go through how this works. Um, our starting point is always data. And when I say data, I mean absolutely unambiguous data that's either numerical or symbolic. That is not walls of text, um, not larger documents, but data. And the first thing we do is we look at that data um, and we extract from it the facts that matter. Um, and when I say facts that matter, it really depends upon what our target is. What is it that we're trying to say? Um, and the actual target, the report that we're creating, is the driver for whatever analytics uh, are going to be applied to the data to pull those facts out. The result of that is we now have a set of facts that are augmenting the data. Um, and these facts represent the things that are true about that data. Um, from there, we step into what we call angles. And this really comes from the fact that uh, as a technology, um, we, are the, we are the product of a partnership, a partnership between journalism and engineering. Um, and the notion of an angle is what is our take on these facts? Um, uh, are you doing better than you have done in the past? 
Um, are there particular things that you are doing wrong? Are there particular areas that you need to focus on? Those are all the types of angles that are drawn out of those facts. And once we have those angles in place, we have a characterization of the thing it is that we're trying to describe, the event that has happened um, uh, at the event level. At that point, then we move over into, uh, into the structure. That is the structure of the document, the report, the, the story that we're trying to tell. And for each of the elements in that structure, for each of the elements in that report, um, we drive back into those angles and pull out the relevant pieces of information to create an overall report uh, with the individual content elements really depending upon the angles, which depend upon the facts, which depend upon the data. The product of that is a representation of what we want to say. Uh, and at that point, we apply language. That is, for every single one of those components, we have different ways of saying those components. Um, and in fact, one of the powers of the technology is that it's not a single way to say things, but dozens, if not hundreds, of different ways in which to express the same idea so that we end up creating documents which actually read uh, in a very very human way, actually read as though they were created by human beings. Um, and the product of that then is the full tell narrative. That is the structure. Uh, the structure of the report then drives the uh, application of language to create a, uh, a story. Um, now, we do this in a lot of realms. And I actually, for, for, um, I'm, I'm going to step away from education for a moment and talk about a, a, a tiny little moment in business, um, which is more to be uh, sort of evocative of what we, uh, what we can do in terms of the analytics. Um, uh, this is actually a, a spreadsheet from uh, a company that is gathering point-of-sale information for a huge number of organizations, uh, of, of their franchises. Um, and they, know, they had the idea, and it was the right idea, that if they could grab hold of that information, they could grab hold of that data, they could actually inform the, the subparts of their business, the individual franchisees, um, uh, what they could do to improve um, their, um, uh, their performance. Um, and it was a great idea, but after spending tens of millions of dollars gathering that data, what they ended up with was data. Uh, and it turned out that people had a really hard time understanding. The franchisees had a really hard time understanding that data. And so what, they, what we're doing with them is actually taking that data and turning it into reporting. And I think the most important uh, paragraph here is the last one. Uh, uh, and that is, the new item with the greatest growth opportunity this week was the coffee cake muffin. Increasing your sales by just five units a day to match sales in the region. So it's understanding what your sales are, what the sales of your cohort is, uh, look like. Um, by by, introduce, uh, by in, in increasing your sales by five uh, units a day to match sales in your region would add another $156 to your monthly profit. This amounts to about, about uh, $1,872 over the course of the year. The point here is really straightforward, and that is uh, we have data repositories um, uh, uh, coming from the government, coming from NGOs, um, uh, that are unbelievably powerful, but they're absolutely wasted. Uh, because what's happened is we can take that data um, uh, but then and make it completely available, but then the only people who can get to it are the people who actually understand how to manage that data. And what we're looking at is taking that data figuring out what stories could be told from it, um, how it could be sliced geographically, how it could be sliced down to uh, individual school levels, individual student levels, um, the levels of the individual, uh, so that they can actually have the information, not the data, but the information they need to make decisions about their lives. Um, and so we're looking at, uh, we're looking at places where um, uh, we can tell people the stories uh, and give them the reports based upon the data rather than the data themselves in education, um, in energy, where we can actually embed overall energy information um, uh, uh, with data associated with an individual and give them specific pieces of advice about how they can change their behavior. Um, in health, where instead of getting a report um, based upon your, your, the test scores uh, that you, you have from going in and getting your blood work, um, something that's actually linked to your medical history, linked to your lifestyle, that can give you advice about what you should be doing, what you need to change. 
um, and then looking at growth um, uh, in, the, uh, in the economy, where we start taking other uh, combination of data sources, pulling them together, and doing very focused neighborhood, metro area reporting um, that really give people a sense of what is happening in their lives. Now, um, I'm going to have one more point, and then, uh, and then I, I, I'm, I will be out of my time. Um, uh, so what we're really shooting for is a way to support evidence-based decision-making. Um, but evidence-based decision-making is not based upon just the data. Um, it's based upon the narrative. It's based upon the story. It's based upon the report, um, as opposed to the spreadsheet or the SQL query. Um, uh, and uh, it's really trying to get down to finding ways to take this massive, massive pieces of massive uh, um, repositories of data, personalizing them, localizing them, um, con uh, contextualizing them, so in fact we can tell the right story to the right person at the right time. Um, and then I just want to give you one sense of scale. Um, uh, uh, and this is, a, uh, 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 this is a project that we really love, and that is uh, we get data uh, for Little League games uh, from a, a wonderful company called Game Changer that has a scoring app for Little League games uh, that coaches and dads can use. Uh, so instead of things being on paper, um, they actually hit the data level. Um, and uh, they, they used to uh, publish the stats for every, uh, for every Little League game that was scored. Uh, and they came to us, and we started writing uh, AP-style game stories uh, for them for each of these games. Um, uh, and it's a story that reads as though uh, a sports reporter was there at the game, uh, watching the game um, uh, and reporting on uh, what the kids are doing. Um, uh, we found that, in fact, a, the, a very positive take on everything uh, was, the, was, the, was the best way to do it. Uh, and so it's all about achievement and effort. Uh, what's important here, though, is um, uh, last year we generated uh, 370,000 game stories for Little League games. Um, we're about 700,000 right now, and we'll probably do about 2 million uh, game stories. Um, and so the notion here is that we can personalize, um, we can localize, um, we can get to the right communication at the right time, uh, and we can do it at enormous scale. Um, uh, so that's us, uh, and uh, one of the reasons I'm on this is that um, uh, we are uh, we do we do work in for media companies, we do work in uh, for data companies. Uh, we actually do a, a tremendous amount of work uh, on the business side for uh, uh, associated with data that's generated by companies who are um, who are metering and monitoring their processes, um, and we're looking to uh, actually move into government and public policy data. Um, and the reality is, is wherever there's data, um, we can tell the story. Uh, and the story is something that's colloquial, um, it's linked to people's lives, it's personalizable, um, and it actually gives people access to uh, data uh, that all of the transparency in government, um, uh, you know, exposure of data repositories was supposed to give us, but doesn't, uh, because the people who can manage that data are few and far between. But the people who can read a story, um, well, that's, that's a ubiquitous skill. Um, so that is narrative science. Awesome, Christian. That was really interesting. And so uh, for those of you on the call, the reason that, that uh, narrative science is here should now be obvious, even though they are, uh, as Christian pointed out, a for-profit company, um, they really help to bridge the gulf between the raw data and what the common person can interpret. And the idea here that if you can massively personalize information on health care or government spending or education, uh, you've, you've solved the last mile problem between the data and uh, the uh, thing that, the, that actually begets change in society. Um, we do have a couple of questions um, for you, Christian. I know you talked briefly about the Middle School of Journalism uh, work on creating automated sports journalism, and someone asked a question about that. Uh, so you can tackle that if you want. And uh, we do have one question. Uh, someone was asking for a little more detail on the tool set, maybe the stack and the technology that you use to drink in and analyze this data, and, and maybe a little about how much uh, training you need to give the system. Obviously, if you're talking about sports scores, you want to use words like knocked it out of the park uh, that may not be uh, appropriate when you're talking about, you know, someone's weight changing, for example. So, <laughs> so maybe you can talk a little about the context Unless on Unless they're that a sports too. person and need things in that, ter in that terminology. Um, uh, so uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of our, uh, our code base, uh, right now 
Um, uh, we have, uh, um, uh, we've, we've actually uh, developed a, a, a really nice tool set for our internal use. Um, and so uh, working with us is actually working with, our, ends up uh, being a process of working with our editorial team um, that ends up configuring uh, the system. Um, we do not have, uh, at this point, uh, a tool set for external use yet. Uh, but we're looking at um, at the end of this year uh, to start releasing elements uh, that uh, that people can use to integrate their own data. But re but at this point, um, it's a it's a sp it's a relatively specialized skill, um, and it's all done by our editorial staff. Um, it's a relatively specialized skill to go in and configure the system to actually bring in the right uh, data analytics, to bring in the right um, uh, to make decisions about the right angles. Um, and make the um, both the structural and the language choices, um, uh, but we'll be we're, we're looking at the really at the beginning of uh, you know, end of this year, beginning of next year, to start uh, releasing um, uh, uh, elements of the system that uh, can be configurable by outside sources. Um, but don't let that be a uh, an impediment. This is a uh, this is a we're in a place right now where uh, we're very strongly looking at um, uh, at government data. Uh, at, uh, at where we're really aiming to, uh, to, to give truth to the promise of transparency um, uh, because uh, transparent data is not what anyone wants. They want transparent insight. They want transparent information. Um, uh, so, if, if this is, so this is a, a call to action in terms of people who've got data. Um, we're absolutely interested in having conversations about how we can help. Sure. Uh, okay, so real quickly, what is the tool stack you guys are using? Um, uh, well, I mean, it's all it's all internal proprietary. Um, I mean, we, we, we sit on top of uh, you know everything's written in Python. Um, uh, you know, we use uh, we use Mongo um, uh, because we can uh, we can apply MapReduce, um, uh, and uh, the uh, the you know a collection of open source technologies uh, in terms of managing the data flow. Uh, but we're set up so that um, we can ingest data in a wide variety of ways, um, either through uh, either through feeds or or, or FTP dumps of data. Um, uh, or through uh, uh, an API that, that it, into our system, uh, and we deliver data um, again through uh, through feeds or through returns of our API um, or through uh, through FTP. Okay. Um, and w one last quick question: Obviously, you're doing this. You're publishing the information to make parents proud, to help students study better, whatever. Do you have any uh, sense of the impact that this has happened? Uh, that this is having? Have you seen cases where you convert the data in this way and students' grades go up or people lose weight? How do you how do you track the impact of this once you've done it? Um, it's too early phase in the educational side uh, to start tracking the the impact. Um, but um, I think one of the things that uh, is important for us. Um, is whenever we look at a uh, whenever we look at a uh, a data you know um, a data and the the documents we're producing, we actually go back to uh, sort of traditional best practice, um, and um, and for us as we we haven't got the we, we really haven't got the uh, the all the feedback uh, we need yet, uh, but. I mean, the reality is is that the more focused and the more precise you can be in terms of um, uh, explaining something to somebody um, and providing them with a call to action, um, uh, the more powerful that information is. Uh, but we, we, we're, we're young enough so that we haven't had a tremendous amount of feedback um, in terms of our, um, the advisory component of what we do. Okay, cool. Oh, well, thank you very much. That was a great overview of it and obviously has the potential to change pretty much everything when people get ideas of better stories. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, our, I mean, this is my last comment. Uh, our, our basic belief is that um, uh, wherever there is data right now, um, uh, uh, we need a story. Um, and our technology or, or, or technologies like ours are going to be uh, in place wherever there is data. Um, and uh, I think that's the, f that the future of data is stories. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christian. That was really interesting. All right, moving on, uh, we are now going to talk with Rufus Pollock from the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, obviously, making sure information is transparent and openly available to the world, uh, so it's not just locked up in boxes. Um, it needs individuals to pull that stuff out, companies building services on it, tools wrapped around it, and so on. And uh, Rufus is at the center of that world, uh, trying to make sure that information is open um, and that lots and lots of people uh, have access to it so we can make the world a better place. So I'm going to hand things over now to Rufus Pollock from the Open Knowledge Foundation. Rufus. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alistair. Can everyone, I, I, well, you, everyone's here is okay. Well, it's not like a live situation. So, okay. Um, welcome, everyone. The Open Knowledge Foundation uh, is a non-profit um, that was founded in 2004 in the UK, in fact, but works around the world, uh, but is, and is particularly active in Europe. And we build two kinds of things. So going to exactly what Astor was saying, um, our focus obviously is around open knowledge and open data. Um, what we do is, is we build and incubate tools, apps, and communities to create, use, and share open information because a phrase we're fond of, you know, is that, you know, op open data uh, that isn't used is, is of no value. Um, you know, it, it's making what, you know, I think a point just made, in fact, by the previous presenter, which is right on, is that often just having data available, if, if it doesn't turn into maybe it's a story or, or an analysis that changes the decision or improves our lives in some way, it's not valuable. Uh, we need to have stuff used. And we uh, do emphasize we work on both of, of these areas. Um, as you can see in the, the, the slide here, the kind of tools aspect and then the community aspect. Um, because I think those are two key things. You know, you, you both need the, the infrastructure and the tools to do something with information and data and content, but you also need people. And that can be companies, it can be communities, it can be, um, it can be the government. But we need people as well to be utilizing those tools and to be doing something as a result of what they, they find out. And our mission, our reason for doing this is that we believe that creating an open knowledge commons and developing the tools and communities around that, we can make a significant con contribution to improving governance, research, and economy. And obviously not just us, but all the people who take part in building that uh, data commons. And we'll be, I, I'm looking forward to hearing from some other colleagues or others that I know who are working in this area. So just in this presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about the tools. So I'm going to focus less on the communities of which we have a, a, a several, often work in particular areas. So we work across the spectrum, the Open Knowledge Foundations. We have people who work on uh, textual analysis of, of Shakespeare and presenting Shakespeare. We have people who work on open government data or work on scientific data. But I'm going to focus on this presentation less on the communities or particular areas and on some gen general tools um, that the Foundation uh, has been developing uh, over the last eight years. I want to take a quick step back here, um, and just, I'm sure it may be obvious to, to some of the people listening in here, but just to think through what is the problem, the what, uh, and the why, uh, sorry, the why, before we come to the what of, of, of what we do. And so put crudely, we want to utilize particularly digital information more effectively to improve our lives, governance, the economy, the research. We want to find a better way to get to work, a better way to run our cities in which now I think it's all... 70% of the world's population, and it will soon be more than that, live, and to spend, for example, government money more effectively and legitimately. And the context for this, just to remind ourselves, um, is this the, the explosion of digital information and ever-improving information technology. Um, and I particularly want to emphasize at this moment that the, the, the point at which information technology uh, got to the, to the stage where average citizens, and well, be it here average bureaucrats or even average uh, members of, of corporations at, had access to data on the scale uh, that was necessary, I think, to do that is quite recent. I mean, computing has been around to do data processing almost from the start. But, for example, I, um, as an individual, can today have on my laptop uh, the, entire, uh, the entire set of accounts for a government. Um, you know, literally at the transaction level, um, certainly for several years of those accounts. I, in fact, have the UK government's transactional data on my laptop, and you can have that, for, you know, to the extent it's given out from the US or other countries. And that's quite recent, because we're often talking about gigabytes of data, and sometimes terabytes, um, before we even get to the big data stuff. And just to give a figure, you know, 1994, um, a terabyte of storage cost you about $450,000, and today that will cost you $100. So it's a point recently where the number of people who can engage with data on this kind of scale um, has dramatically increased. So moving to the, the, the next slide here, the open solution, um, the point is, in this context of, ex you know, significantly increasing data and significantly increasing uh, technology, why is open such a big deal? And the answer, you know, why is the open a solution to these problems that we're trying to address? Um, and the answer is that, you know, 
Open Gap Data obviously makes it accessible and reusable. It makes it findable and easy to use, and I'll come to some tools about that. And it allows us to start building and linking. So I think the key word here, often overused word, is scale. Um, we want to, to solve any of these problems. We need to bring data together on a scale uh, that we haven't before. The way that we as humans deal with complexity and the scale challenges is often to divide problems up into manageable chunks, you know, Legoize it, if you like, components of information that we can join back together. And to do that, open is essential, because if we don't have open um, around information, it makes it extremely difficult to recombine. I should emphasize, we at the Open Knowledge Foundation do not think that all data uh, will immediately be open, or that eventually all data will be open. We think it's going to obviously be a, a mixed economy. But we do see a world rather different from today, uh, especially actually in business, which is like open source, in which it's almost, un you know, every business now, even if it's building proprietary software, somewhere in its stack is using probably open source software or an open source tool. And we see a world in which certainly many of the base core data sets that we're using are going to be open, just because of the scale issue. If we, to be able to build on top of those, for those things to be maintained, we need, we need that. So I'm going to come into uh, you know, some of the tools and applications that we've been building to enable that. So one more point here is the open solution. So okay, we want to give our data. We want to allow people to share. We want to allow people to reuse it. We want to allow people to combine it and build on it. But there are a lot of barriers. Um, <laughs> if you go out there, as we uh, did uh, you know, when we started, and look for open data or data generally, uh, it's difficult to find, especially from government if we're talking about it. Data sets are very deep in websites. But this is just as true often of companies. And I have to say I'm emphasizing here sometimes companies whose business is not immediately data already. Um, we're thinking of corporations, NGOs, government, who actually utilize data a lot and produce lots of data, but don't tend to organize it very well. Um, you know, many times we come across from the smallest nonprofit um, up to reasonably sized companies. You know, data management within their organisation at best is is basically you know Excel and the shared drive on their computer. So data sets are often buried. Uh, there's little or no relevant information from, for example, for search engines. It's hard to find information. Therefore, using the tools that we have out there, there's no central access point. Um, there's unclear licensing a lot. A lot of time, people are releasing data that isn't open. They might even mean it to be open, but isn't. And it can be difficult to use data sets, um, be it from government or others. There's no data API. There's no way to see what's in it. There's little quality information. Am I getting something that's a complete waste of my time to bother downloading and looking at, or is this really useful to me right now? And there's no way often to utilize the community. Um, one of the great powers, obviously, of open data is that you've got the ability, at least, for community involvement in a big way. I mean, that can happen to close data, but it's much more, much more likely um, in an open data situation, but often there are pool tools to allow the community to contribute. So um, particularly on this front, we would, uh, I'm going to talk about a piece of software called CCAN, um, which, which we developed and now has had contributions from quite a few other people, um, which is a kind of data portal, data management system, as we call it. Um, obviously, people in some sense have been building data management systems from the beginning of the software era, but in a way that we saw content management systems, people put stuff up on the web in the old days. They would, um, you know, when the web began, they would, uh, F, you know, write your HTML by hand and FTP it up. And now we have content management systems that automate some of that workflow, that provide services and infrastructure um, that are useful to doing content publishing. Um, and again, people have done content publishing from long before the web. Similarly, we have a similar situation I think, today around data, which is that often really our data publishing consists of Excel and, and if we're lucky, Dropbox or Google Docs. And our process for doing data management, uh, to data publishing especially onto the web, is very poor. And so CCAN uh, is a piece of software, as I said, that we started developing in 2007. Uh, and in particular, is is used very widely. So um, just to say some features of CCAN, it's an open source. Uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation only builds open source software. Um, so it's free and open source software. It's a data portal platform, data management system, I think of it, platform. It makes it easy to publish, share, and find data. Um, it involves a bunch of features. I'll come to a bit more in a moment. But rich search and data publishing, integrated data storage, processing, viewing, and visualization, geospatial integration, um, and extensive and flexible, not just from the fact that it's open source, but with particular plug-in architecture um, and a variety of add-ons, and of course, a rich data API and catalog API. And 
just to emphasize, it's a, it's a free and open source piece of software, but it is heavily used in production environments, particularly actually by government, but also uh, others, including NGOs um, and the media. So this includes data.gov.uk, which has been one of the, along with data.gov in the US, one of the best known government data sites, although I, would, uh, I can go into some detail and agree with the previous speaker about some of the limitations of those but also the IIT registry, for example, uh, municipal deployments in the US, the UK, Helsinki in Finland, um, and also, in fact, now South America, Brazil, the Brazilian government have just released theirs, Argentina, um, and also other countries. So very widely used around the world, and with professional services now from a lot of several different companies who provide support from it, including, including the Open Knowledge Foundation. And just to talk a little bit through it, one of the things also that CCAN runs, and the reason it was actually originally developed by us, we did not develop it to, to supply governments, <laughs> but to, to, to satisfy our own need for a way to manage data at the Open Knowledge Foundation more effectively. Um, more here, kind of the raw and base data, we often then will build specific applications. And one thing we run on it is called the Data Hub, datahub.io, which is a community uh, data hub. Anyone can go there and share uh, data. Um, a bit like GitHub, if you know GitHub for, for code. Um, and so the Data Hub is somewhere where anyone can, can get, use, and share data online and get a data API and visualize data a bit and so on. And just to show some quick, quickly um, some features from this one I mentioned earlier um, is, is on the published side. So kind of rich, both machine, uh, machine interfaces and human interfaces for publishing data, adding some metadata to it, uploading a file. Um, and, and I emphasize that often one of the things you're seeking to do in publishing data is not just shove an Excel file online or even you know, your five gigabyte file online, but add some information about it. One of the difficulties uh, we see is that there's a, lot of, there's a lot of data now being put out there, but often it's lacking the readme or the documentation. It's lacking the relevant information for search engines to find it. So adding that, that information around the data set is often invaluable in making it useful. Um, the other aspect is search. There's very rich um, search capabilities um, if, if needed, um, in addition to the fact that obviously things get found via the search engines on the web, um, faceting, um, geospatial search, um, full text search, and so on. Um, in addition, um, there are there's quite a bit of visualization along with there also being a data API. So this is kind of standard, some of the standard, but you know, um, basic graphing abilities you have here. Um, there's also geospatial search um, and a grid view. So you can search, you can search in the data to, to find things near places or whatever. If you, it's literally the case here that you know, in, in a minute, if you're sharing data on one of these sites, be it whether you're a government or using the data hub, um, within about a minute, you can go from you know, a file um, with, with some information into it to a, to a geospatial view like this and, and to searching and visualizing in this kind of way. Um, and the other key point, and um, it's something almost we actually emphasize, that some of our capabilities, such as graphing, are intentionally somewhat limited. They're, they're good and they're functional, but are our experience, and it goes back to a point made by the previous speaker, if you try to tell a good story or really show some insight to data, that often involves some degree of customization uh, or building your own app or building your own visualization. And at that point, you obviously want a data API. You want to, you want to be able to get at the data you've, you've uploaded or stored via a machine interface so that you can build apps and tools and visualizations of, of your own. Um, and that's something that CCAN supports uh, out of the box. And uh, lastly, I mentioned that one of our emphasizes, emphasis as well at the, the foundation uh, is, on, is on the kind of small pieces loosely joined, particularly components that other people as well as ourselves can reuse. So CCAN, as I mentioned, has been uh, both with our support and independently reused by many people. And one tool I wanted to mention is something called recline.js, um, which you can find at reclinejs.com, which is the data visualization and grid view component that we use in CCAN, but which has been developed as a standalone uh, JavaScript application that anyone, and library that anyone can use. Okay, uh, I'm going to move ahead now to, to give a quick overview um, of another and related project and, and technology stack that, that integrates uh, with, with CCAN and the Data Hub, but also stands alone. And this, this is a project and a dream we've had for a while at the Foundation, which is of, um, if you like, of mapping public financial information worldwide. So this is an aim, if you know, OpenStreetMap, if you like, to build an OpenStreetMap of money for uh, 
citizens and governments is contributing to put out their public financial information and weave it together into a way that can be understood. Um, and came from a project called Where Does My Money Go, which I hope is, uh, hope is self-explanatory, which was a, a website still existing which shows uh, UK citizens where their tax dollars go and, and has actually been deployed. There's a Donde Van Mis Impuestos uh, in South America and, and Spain, and I know one version as well exists in the US. And um, uh, open spending, as you can see, after uh, we did a visual version of Where Does My Money Go two or three years ago, open spending launched formally as this greater project across the world about a year and a half ago, and we've now got to about 23 countries, and uh, we are, in a grassroots manner, get collecting data gradually. Um, sometimes governments give it to us, sometimes we have to get it from their websites. We do an awful lot of what I call data wrangling uh, to extract data from PDFs and other sources and put them into a machine-readable form and to create, um, to create visualizations. Um, this is a tree map. Um, this is showing, in fact, in a particular municipality in the UK, as one of these uh, for the for the US and various other places we have data from. I'm showing where, where, where money is going. Is it going on health? Is it going on social services? Is it going on housing? Um, you can see there's also something we actually built ourselves. We do quite a bit of custom visualization development, what we call the bubble tree, an interactive hierarchical uh, bubble, bubble chart. And again, this is showing UK money. Um, to show one extra example, this in fact, I don't know how well people can see this on their screen, but this is actually the budget for the for Sao Paulo in Brazil, uh, the region around Sao Paulo, showing again where money is going there. Um, and often one of the interesting things is to see the differences across countries and priorities. And at this point, um, to wrap up uh, somewhat, uh, there's one other last project I want to mention. Uh, again, in terms of this kind of brings across the uh, community building um, aspect of our work. And tools aspect of our work uh, in a project called the School of Data. Um, and the aim of the School of Data is to create materials and an online course and a mentoring system in order to teach people the kind of data skills, the data wrangling, the data science skills, um, for them to, so maybe not everyone, but for more people to be able to engage and understand and use data uh, effectively. And that ranges from, if you like, the banker uh, to the civil servant to the activist. And the School of Data, thanks to a generous support from the Shuttleworth Foundation and the Open Society Foundation, uh, is, is in fact the first sprint will be kicking off next week and we hope to launch it formally, the first version of the, the material and, and challenges in uh, June or July of this year. And I emphasize that we welcome uh, partners, be they uh, donors, uh, people contributing material, people running courses or, or similar. Um, so if you're interested in data and you're interested in data wrangling or data science, uh, we'd love to, love to hear from you and have your input or contribution to or partnership in running and developing the School of Data. And that's it from me. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. And it sounds like you've been fighting the good fight for longer than most of us knew it was a fight to be fought, so thanks for that. <laughs> um, so I have some interesting questions here in the background. Um, first of all, uh, Um, Ted Wong asked about the role of libraries in making data available for all. Traditionally, that's been where you would go if you wanted to look something up as a local library. How do you see that changing, you know, in the in the era? We'll be hearing from sure. Wikimedia later on, but also uh, what is the new role of the library to make this stuff available and, and make it machine readable rather than somewhere you have to go understand a Dewey Decimal System to get things? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think the idea of data librarians is one I've heard quite a lot. I certainly know uh, I'm actually based near, near London, near, in fact, the Sanger Institute, which I don't know if people know. The Welcome Sanger Center is one of the major centers that sequence the genome, and we're there in big, big data and open data very early on. And I know, in fact, they hired a data librarian a couple of years ago uh, to, to do exactly that. I mean, I think the challenge here, I'd say, for, is a genuine one for librarians, which is maintaining, being blunt, is maintaining relevance in the age of Google. You know, bridging libraries where this side of expertise, but also a matching function. I went there looking for some information. Um, in the age of the web, what does the librarian, what does the librarian do in that role? And I think they do have a very interesting role, whether it's still in the traditional library setting, but is of that being an expert and that person facilitating um, the kind of discovery um, and also curation. I think that's another key point. You know, librarians' a big role, obviously, is curating um, uh, data. Um, but I do think we are seeing a kind of 
broadening of participation. Uh, you know, a single key thing for librarians to do is to embrace that, embrace the broader community. So I'd, I'd love to be seeing uh, data librarians and data curators turning up. Um, you know, I think that's a great, a great idea. But, but increasing the modern technological options we see now. Sure. Um, okay, a couple of questions here about, um, we'll, we'll wrap up with these two, but um, how do you convince people to open their data? Obviously, if we had that answer, your job would be a lot simpler, but what usually works when you're trying to persuade anyone sure. from a supermarket to a government to give up some information? Sure. I mean, I think it's obviously, in certain circumstances, there's a lot, it's a lot, there are certain groups that it's more attractive in theory to. So one is government, because they generally don't sell data, um, and the other is that, yes, for example, research and science. Um, ironically, of course, it turned out to be quite difficult in those groups for various reasons. I mean, scientists actually, there's a lot of power that comes from controlling their data in governments, too, um, but they are the starting groups. I mean, I think one of the more interesting is companies at the moment. So, you know, I think it was amazing and very interesting to see Nike last year, you know, hiring an open data evangelist, having an open data plan. I think there the answer is to, to companies is to say, well, um, you know, where, where do you need the scale benefits? So, you know, might not be, if, you know, you might not be as a, a supermarket necessarily open sourcing all of your price or <laughs> transaction data, but you might be saying, well, wouldn't it be useful to, you know, uh, open uh, information on some of our product line, maybe not every bit of it, or, you know, it, it, and would that be a way to get, like, social engagement? Like, there'd be some geeks out there who'd love to know, you know, play around with historical stuff or do cool visualizations, and also as a way to, you know, get, get sometimes engage with your consumer audience in a certain way, not maybe directly through them being data geeks, but in the things that could be built with it. So, and again, I think looking at the example of Nike, are there, are there scale issues? So Nike were opening up because they wanted, uh, you, know, um, you know, supply chain information, and they had a lot of suppliers that weren't at Nike, you know, weren't part of Nike. For them, to create a pool, they needed to be opening up some of their data and then saying to everyone else, you share yours. So I think particularly at companies, you've got to be asking, don't go for the crown jewels, but where are there where's places where there's strategic interest, either in getting partnerships, in getting that scale which you get from a commons, or in engaging with your customers or consumers or other, other parts of your value chain? Sure. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much again for all your work on this. Uh, certainly, as people start to realize the need for an ecosystem as a way to make their worlds work, we see more and more businesses that make money uh, as a result of the data they've opened up and feel people finding new ways to, to drive uh, that into sales or whatever else, hopefully we get more and more examples to point to. Absolutely. I mean, to leave you, if you like, with a sound boy, which is, you know, data, data is a platform, not a commodity. You build on it, you don't sell it. Um, I think that's going to be the mantra for a lot of this in the future, and there's going to be big money to be made, but a lot of it on open data. Thank you, Alistair. Anyway, over uh, to the next. Uh, thank you, Rufus, and I think that's probably the most tweetable line so far, nicely put. All right, up next, uh, moving right along, uh, Jake Porway is joining us from DataKind, uh, formerly Data Without Borders, and uh, he's brought with him several of the people who are making uh, um, use of the connections that DataKind provides between data scientists and people who have real problems they need fixed using uh, data and math. Uh, so Jake's going to uh, introduce us to three of the case studies behind what DataKind's been up to and talk about um, how it's making an impact in the DC Action for Children, the Grameen Foundation, and GuideStar. Jake. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alistair, and thank you for having all of us. Uh, I wish I could actually hear the audience to hear the thunderous applause from Rufus and Chris's talk. Those are just such awesome projects. It's a real honor to be here amongst great speakers. Um, and as Alistair intro, I'm doubly honored to have three fantastic representatives uh, from three really great nonprofits that have been collaborating with us at DataKind uh, to really think about new ways of using data to better improve the world. So I actually want to get out of the way as quickly as possible and let them talk to you guys because they're really the story here. But to set the stage, I'd like to give you a, a quick intro about uh, what DataKind is. Um, and to do that, I'd like to sort of go back, instead of looking to the future, sort of take you back in time a little bit, back to kind of the dark ages of humanity, uh, sort of a technological wasteland of uh, the year 2000, back when this is what it was like to rent a movie. Right? You had no idea what was good or what was bad. You kind of had to just go up and down the roads. It was, it was horrible and, and depressing, and we all lived horrible lives. Uh, but Thankfully, we now, of course, live in the future where with the click of a button, you can just figure out exactly what movies you should watch, you know what's going to be good or bad, and you can make these better decisions about how to live your life. 
And of course, the big change here was data. Right? We started collecting all this data about what people liked and what they didn't, and that allowed us to make these better decisions so we can all live more efficiently, if you will. And these data-driven decisions, as many of the people in this audience are probably aware, are touching every aspect of our lives these days. Everything from these movies that we watch to uh, how we get around the globe, get from point A to B, uh, how we decide what products we want to buy, what's recommended to us, and even who we decide who to be friends with. So there's a huge number of data-driven decisions being made out here, and that's because we're at the beginning of this data revolution, right? Almost every interaction that we have with each other or with the world now takes place with a computer or a cell phone or something digital involved. And because of that, we collect all this data that can be mined, can be analyzed to help us make better decisions. And yet for all that excitement, it seems that most of the effort we're putting into studying this data still falls on the private side, the, the commercial side. You know, a lot of the things that I just mentioned, you know, finding movies, buying products, connecting with your friends, they're really great applications, but they're applications that I think of as making really comfortable lives ever so slightly more comfortable. And so I think a lot of the questions on a lot of the data scientists' minds who spend their time optimizing ad networks is whether we can do something more with this, with all this data that's available. And so the first place that we looked to answer this question was with the data scientists. You know, these sort of a contentious term, you call them statisticians, analysts, whatever you call them, these are the guys who work with data to help us make better decisions to live better lives. And the thing about data scientists that a lot of people on this call probably know is that they don't just work on data nine to five. These are people doing weekend projects, nighttime projects. Uh, they, they're increasingly taking place uh, in things called uh, hackathons. So a uh, hackathon for anyone on the call who doesn't know is you know, a 24-hour jam where a bunch of programmers and data scientists get together and just see what cool stuff they can come up with. And as a data scientist myself, I remember being thrilled going to my first hackathon because here I was sitting in this room with all these people with math PhDs, statistics degrees, and amazing hacking skills. I couldn't wait to see what we were going to come up with because it just felt like there was so much power there. We were going to come up with something truly fantastic. It was going to have something that would have so much impact. It was going to be truly world changing. And what we came up with was kind of unfulfilling in the end. You know, we, there was an application to help people park their car, another one to help people find local deals. And these are great apps, but it just felt like these were not quite enough. They're more the same. And understandably, I think this is because if you give you know, a data scientist or a programmer who tend to be 24-year-olds a problem, they're going to solve their own problems. And a 24-year-old is more concerned with where to park their car, not necessarily where to find low-income housing. So before we start talking about hacking education or hacking poverty, we realize, of course, there are social organizations who are already trying to make the world a much better place. And these guys have tons of data. They have data about their surveys. They have data about their finances. They have data from maps that are available. And more than just the data that these groups collect to make the world a better place, there's also open data, you know, like the data that Rufus talked about or government data that's out there or the increase in mobile technology. It means there's a huge amount of data out there available to them through their programs. So there's a lot of data available uh, for the social organizations uh, to make use of, but unfortunately, they don't always have a lot of people to look at it. And there's kind of a lack of capacity sometimes because it's not easy to necessarily compete with Wall Street and Silicon Valley in terms of resources if you're a nonprofit. You know, if you're a six-person operation, you probably can't hire an on-staff data scientist. So all that potential and all that data that could be used in the same way we're using it to make decisions about how to find movies and how to uh, find restaurants you want to go to, could be used in these cases, but just sort of gets lost. So it seems like a sort of obvious matching problem. We have a lot of people really good at looking at data without a lot of social outputs for it. Social organizations have lots of data, but no one helped them look at it. So that was why we founded DataKind. Uh, as Alistair mentioned, we used to be known as Data Without Borders, and we try to connect data scientists with social organizations to help them better use, analyze, and visualize their data so they can do their missions better. And we engage with organizations on a large number of, uh, of fronts, so everything from these weekend data dives where we invite organizations to a sort of weekend hackathon and work with their data there, up through long-term engagements like fellowships and something we call the data core. And uh, you know, the hope is that by connecting these organizations or connecting these communities, what you enable is data scientists to have a social impact, give social organizations a chance to maximize their impact, and in the process, we all sort of get to live in a better world. So it's been a a lot of fun. We've seen a lot, seen a lot of really amazing results out of this. Um, but I think it would, of course, be most instructional to people to just let the organizations themselves 
speak to what they've been doing. But I'll let Emily tell you more about that, so I will turn it over to Emily. Great. Well, thanks, Jake. Um, I'm Emily, and I work at Grameen Foundation. And today I wanted to talk about our Community Knowledge Worker Program in Uganda. I'm going to start, I'll just call it the CKW program. And I'll start by just providing some background on the project to give some context. So this program provides agricultural information to subsistence farmers in extremely rural and poor areas of Uganda. In these regions, farmers are trying to scratch out a living on very, very small plots of land. And they have no information about market prices, about weather or ways to resolve crop or disease issues that might happen. They're truly at the very, very last mile, and information just isn't getting to them, and they are incredibly vulnerable. So the community, the CKW program, tries to change all that. We recruit people directly from the community to service CKWs, so that many of them are subsistence farmers themselves. And they're trained to use a menu-based search application on Android phones. They're assigned an area with it in which to work, and they essentially walk from farmer to farmer, answering questions about market prices, weather, uh, which is really important to know when to plant, and questions about crops and livestock. So over the past two years, we've spun up over 800 of these CKWs all across Uganda. We've reached over 60,000 unique farmers and have provided over 1 million search queries. And because we're using the Android phone, we're automatically collecting uh, GPS location, time of data, and interaction. But also, with each new farmer that we interview, we collect key demographic information on the types of crops and livestock that they grow, the size of the farm, and a simple set of 10 questions that allow us to assign the probability of their poverty level. So there's questions like, does every member of your family own a single pair of shoes? Or does anyone in your family own more than two pairs of clothes? And I just sort of have to say, as I've sort of scrolled through data on the Excel spreadsheets, as impersonal as data can be when you see sort of row after row of, you know, families with 10 children or 11 children and not having pairs of shoes for all of them and nobody owning a second pair of clothes, it's, it's a very intense and, and, and moving experience. So while this data isn't big data, as people like to say, they use that term very sort of loosely and casually, it is very, very rich micro and deep level data on people and interactions that usually far, fall far outside any collection, data collection systems or activities that happen. So when people do, you know, you hear about sort of countrywide surveys that happen, these, <laughs> these surveys are really not getting into the remote regions and, and um, a deep understanding of these kinds of people is really lacking. So we're starting to, to mine this data and look at this data for deeper insights about our program and our clients. But like so many, non, as Jake said, like so many nonprofit organizations, we didn't have the fund to hire experts with the necessary skill set to really help us look at this. And so that's where DataKind helped us out. We did a, you know, a weekend data dive-a-thon, um, and they were able to drill into some several key questions about our program. And just a personal passion of mine is really to make sure that we use data to drive actual decision making about the programs that we build to end poverty. Um, I think like many organizations, we have our fair share of dashboards with maps and graphs and charts and pie graphs, um, chock full of data that nobody really can use or, or, or take action on. And so um, as we started working with data, I really wanted to make sure that we tackled a question that would have an immediate impact on our program. So I worked with Jake, um, sorry, I guess next slide. Um, with Jake's help, we identified a very specific question. Do bicycles, which were recently deployed to our CKWs to increase their performance, um, do bicycles actually do that? Do they in increase the performance of the CKWs in terms of the number of search queries they generate, the number of farmers they reach, and the geographic distance that they travel? And the answer, surprisingly, was no. They actually didn't have an impact. Um, and this was just a very specific and concrete example that I could take back to the team in Uganda, show them the data, and immediately they took a decision on the program. They stopped rolling out the bicycles. They were $60 each, um, incredibly expensive in that, in that realm, and are now looking at other things that need to be combined with bicycles, either new incentive programs or things like that, to really get the performance impact that they want to see. 
So with Data Kind's help over a single weekend, I was able to demonstrate to others in the organization. And there's a lot of, I think all of us on this call know that and understand the power of data, but some are still sort of haven't yet drunk the data Kool-Aid. Um, so with this kind of, these kinds of examples, I was able to go back and, just, and show our org that you can use data not just to measure your performance, but also to make concrete decisions about how to improve the programs that you're building that, you know, whose goal is to essentially end poverty. So with that, I'll turn it over to um, our next speaker. And Jake, you can introduce them. Yeah, sure. I just want to uh, put a fine point on that to say that this is an, a really amazing initiative where, uh, you know, Grameen had a, a ton of mobile data that's really rich about all these interactions. And like Emily said, may not have had the capacity, but what's really important here is that they sort of realized the important, I know she mentioned that she had drunk the, the data Kool-Aid already. I mean, we were very fortunate to work with MLA because she was very devoted to finding ways to use this data and finding ways to get uh, analytics around it. And I think this is a really, just a great example of how uh, organizations can use their data to start to get to that question of are we having an impact? You know, are our interventions, do they matter? Uh, that's the, sort of the holy grail, I think, of a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations. And Grameen is doing an amazing job uh, doing that. And I also want to add, Emily, correct me if I'm wrong here, if there's anything you want to change about this, but uh, you know, Grameen is continuing to work with uh, volunteers that are data experts to sort of continue looking at other programs, too. And that's one of the things that really excites me is, is seeing uh, that sort of continued commitment to just saying, look, if we just had the resources, we would keep doing this. And uh, that's sort of what warms my heart beyond seeing just people work on a weekend event, but people actually continuing to work together and Connecting those and, communities. and that's right, Jake. I mean, data kind of working with them really helped us kick off and help the organization understand the power of data. And so our plan is, as Jake said, to spin up a data analytics team internally so we can really have that dedicated resource, those dedicated resources to, to help us drive this stuff forward. So I love and, it. Awesome and a huge stuff. help. Super inspiring. So thank you so much, Emily. And for the audience, we'll do questions uh, at the end for everybody. Um, so I'm going to turn it over next to Haisuk Chung uh, from the DC Action for Children, a uh, super awesome group that we collaborated with in DC. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Haisuk. Thanks, Jake. Um, I will just spend a few minutes talking about the mission of our organization and how we got connected to Datakind. Um, DC Action is part of a network of uh, organizations across the country funded by the Anna E. Casey Foundation to um, uh, provide timely data and provide analysis to really impact uh, policy and to really make the city and as a whole, think about how funding and how policies impact children and overall well-being. So in a city where decisions are often made um, by relationships or uh, the lack of a foundation of core data, this is very important um, in the district. So uh, what is BC Kids Count? The philosophy is that when we approached data kind to work uh, over a weekend with data volunteers and data ambassadors, we went to them using our data with a philosophy and a premise that where children live in the city, here in, ward, uh, in the different wards in the District of Columbia, where they live, where they play, where they learn, would deeply impact um, all aspects of their life. Our city has uh, poverty rates that you would not believe. One in three live in poverty, which means under the federal poverty uh, line, which means a family of four is living on 22000 a year. So what does this say? What does the data say? Really, our hypothesis was that concentrated poverty and this deep cycle of poverty was not able to take us away from the very traditional way of thinking about uh, resources, allocation of resources for different um, programs in the city. So we wanted to present uh, an opportunity for Datakind and the uh, lovely volunteers and our data heroes, and many of whom are on the call. So just a shout out for Jersey and Max and Jason from DC Action. And we really wanted them to take us to the next step of uh, utilizing data, which is you know, if there are differences in how individuals are going to succeed in the city just based on allocation of resources and policies, we wanted to show and showcase why. We wanted to take the data beyond just the PDF 
series of, um, of uh, documents that would just say the same thing over and over again, which we know is that there is very deep poverty here in the city for the children. So our questions for Data Kind and this tremendous partnership over this weekend of um, volunteers was how do we get beyond our current capacity? We are a staff of six. We are funded to do data work, but we don't have really the capacity. And so this is where, as Emily mentioned, where Data Kind came in. You know, we had very tough questions and non-traditional questions about how to visualize uh, traditional child well-being data sets like uh, test scores and child poverty. Um, we also wanted to figure out visually how to overlay place data and move away from uh, this conversation and this rhetoric about blaming individuals for where they are. Um, so we wanted to look at really place uh, indicators and a series of data that would be away from really individualized outcomes but more of a neighborhood level outcome. We also wanted to investigate and propose um, prototypes of index around are there signals, are there indicators that showcase for the city and for the legislators that depending on where a child lives, it will project how they succeed in life and in school. And our premise was that yes, it can, the data can show, and we wanted to uh, be able to do that with data kind partners. And then really, you know, take all these questions and take this aspirational goal and make a prototype. And if you go to the next slide, map that was just beyond measure. We could not believe that we could create this with just data volunteers. And our data heroes, what they did was take traditional book, traditional and non-traditional neighborhood indicators to really showcase visually how children are faring in the city. And as you can see, based on neighborhood indicators that you can see on this uh, uh, table here on the right, we have both traditional, like test scores, but we also have a number of libraries and um, child care facilities. We wanted to show very non-traditional ways of how to think about is a neighborhood very friendly for raising children. So this just really showcased what can happen in 36 hours. I think what we were struck with, especially being as small as we are, is that DataKind not only took us to scale in terms of building out capacity right away, but they also posed a lot of interesting questions as a nonprofit uh, really working with and for the community or with data, you know, they were asking us very thoughtful questions about instead of looking at data on a year-to-year -year basis, how do we take this and really have long-term policy implications? How do we push the city to really think about resources and allocation of resources based on what we present? You know, we are um, a city that is very eventful and we hear lots of animated uh, things happening in the council and we want to drive this conversation where data actually pushes some legislative decisions. And that's not been the case, but we want to start moving towards that. And so that's why the work with DC Kids Count is so critically important in our city. And I think that's where DataKind and our volunteers really um, took us to a place that we could have never probably have gotten to unless we had the uh, resources from multiple, multiple funders. And so we thought this would take a few years. And Jake could speak to this, but it really took, this is just a prototype, so we can't imagine where we'll be by fall. So we just wanted to thank DataKind and all our uh, volunteers and to get us to really think about um, data in a way that's, like a speaker said earlier, that not creates, that only creates the visualization but also the narrative. You know, we want to say how children are impacted when we are in a city where one in three live in poverty. We want to take the data and make story, but also using stories as a showcase to why things need to move. So Jake, I'll leave Thank that up to you and transition to the next speaker. Sure. Thank you so much. That's a really awesome stuff, and that's a great visualization. We can put a link up if people want to play with that. Um, that's really cool. And I just want to put one point in here, which is, you know, people often mention, like, my name or data kind, but all of this work is from the organizations, people like Hysook, Emily, and Braz, and our volunteers. I mean, the data heroes that Hysook mentioned, uh, the group that worked with Grameen in San Francisco and is continuing to, I mean, these are, you know, people who spend their days at Tumblr and Google that are doing this on their, their side at projects. So really all the, you know, amazing, amazing credit goes to them and the work that these guys are doing, and I'm just happy to be able to help talk about it, be associated with them. 
Um, and just to mention that really quickly, that the DC team is actually continuing to work with DC Action. They set up their own data dives. They meet monthly to keep doing this project, and that's just so awesome and inspiring to me. Um, I want to make sure we give uh, Braz Brandt from GuideStar a chance to talk here, too, uh, before we close out. So I'm just, without any fancy interest, going to turn it over to Braz. Thanks, Jake. Um, sure. and good afternoon and good morning, everybody. I just real quickly wanted to touch on, I think, a different story from our, our work with DataKind and the DC Data Dive in, in particular, but in a larger picture of what we see as our, what's going to become an ongoing relationship with DataKind. The DC Data Dive for us, and, well, let me back up and say, for those who don't know who GuideStar is, we are, you know, in effect, the national database of nonprofit organizations. We've been around for about 16 years, and we have data on 2.2 million nonprofits and digitized financial data for just over 350,000 of them. And that's a lot of data. And our first big mission-driven project was revolutionizing philanthropy by making that data available online. And since then, we've been helping spark small revolutions in the sector using data, promoting transparency, getting information in the hands of donors so that they can understand what's going on in the sector and make the most informed giving decision possible. And when we had an opportunity to work with DataKind and the DC Data Dive, we started thinking, now we have open data moving forward. Now that we have these great initiatives to take what has been our differentiator for over oh, a decade, and our data that we have on the nonprofit sector, what can we do to say the next revolution in the sector around generating information? And we took in front of the data scientists two interesting questions. Is there a way to use all this data that we have to build a predictive model for the failure of nonprofit organizations based on what they've done in the past, based on their finances primarily? And conversely, because we didn't want to be the negative Nellies in the room, we also wanted to say we've also got information through some partnerships and acquisitions we have with organizations like Philanthropedia and their network of, se of sector experts. Are there things we can do to start identifying high-performing nonprofits that maybe still be under the radar and that would be fantastic places for donors and foundations to effectively give and make change happen in the world? Uh, the short answer out of the data dive is we started to get answers to those questions, but we got so much more out of the out of, out of the experience. Yes, there are predictive models we can start building, and they're interesting. And you take our data and you start to add on the other data that out there that the scientists brought to the table. The GDP data, for example, added to our financial data as part of our predictive model, starts to show very, very interesting trends. That as the GDP generally starts to increase, interestingly enough, it appears to be that the number of organizations that start to fail also increases. The better the economy does, the more likely it is an organization is going to fail. And that's a very curious founding, that we can start to rationalize about people's ability to take on risk and start funding organizations that may not be able to effectively use the money or spin off and say that now that I have more money in my pocket, I'm more willing to go out and start my own great new organization without much experience in the sector about how to take an organization and make it sustainable. But more interestingly, what it started to recognize, help us recognize is the fact that data wants to be open. Our people want to use our data. We want to use other people's data. And partnerships with organizations like DataKind so that we have that team of analytic, brilliant people that can start looking at our data and start uncovering things that we haven't thought about before, partnered with the data that we already have and starting to shift the data that we're starting to look for to the organizations that have data that we want to partner with, or data that we have never even thought about mashing up with ours to start answering interesting problems. So I think the most interesting thing for us at GuideStar is, yes, we can start answering some very interesting data questions in the sector. And we can start using data kind and the data core to help us answer those questions and do a lot of that capacity building that, you know, frankly, Jake mentioned, most organizations don't have. But more importantly, it started to get GuideStar and I hopefully the sector now thinking about open data and data transparency and partnerships and taking a lot of the barriers that we traditionally put up in the data that we collect and the data that we have and eroding them 
because the value that comes out of that, the knowledge and information that can be generated is so much more valuable to the sector as a whole when it comes time to make giving decisions. What are the best organizations to give your money to because they're going to be better able to make change happen in the world locally and things that you care about and internationally and different causes that really strike your heart. What can we do to help transform that change using folks like DataKind and other data that we have and want to get. That for me I think is the bigger question that GuideStar has been struggling with since our work with DataKind is that data scientists are good. Data is much more powerful and the things we can do with it that start generating information and knowledge is really going to be that next revolution in philanthropy. So. I try to keep that brief because I don't have a lot of beautiful visualizations like the folks at PC Action for Children, and they're a great group. So thank you, Jake, and thank you for the wonderful work that you've been doing and continue to do. So thank you so much, Brad. I mean, I think that was an awesome example. Even though Brad's mentioned there may not be fancy visuals, uh, anyone who had come to our DC Data Dive would have seen that uh, GuideStar's group of volunteers basically had a mini machine learning conference uh, where they actually showed all these different models they'd come up with. Uh, it was incredibly impressive to see sort of in a day all the models that people had built. Um, and I do want to get out of the way here so that if we have any time left, people can ask questions of the, of the speakers. Um, but I just also want to put the final point on what Brad said, which is that a lot of these collaborations do show how data can be opened up and, and what sort of other data sources can be brought in to help solve these problems. And that's something that I, I found it was sort of shocking and amazing in watching GuideStar that they found people who knew about government data, they knew about other nonprofits' data, and they've gone a long way towards, uh, GuideStar's gone a long way towards promoting opening their own data and, and bringing other open data in around the nonprofit community. So I just want to thank everybody who, who came to speak on our site. I think they're all incredible, inspirational examples of nonprofits using data to drive better decisions so that they too can have applications and, or, and uh, outcomes that are better than just figuring out, you know, where you're going to actually find a restaurant to eat at Friday night and instead actually figure out how you can help uh, improve the world. So with that, thanks everyone for having us and I'll turn it over to Alistair. All right, Jake. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, some great examples of seeing this stuff be concrete and I appreciate you rallying everyone there. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for some Q&A if you want. Um, I don't know if you want to field the questions from the Q&A tab and grab a couple that you think you want to pose to the group. Uh, sure. Let me just look through here quickly. Um, there was uh, one, one big question here was about how you can leverage data to foster collaboration among nonprofits and the development of new initiatives to tackle these sort of deep systemic public problems. Um, and I'll let anyone uh, jump in on this, uh, or actually maybe I should sort of turn it over. I think Braz, maybe if you want to reiterate something about that, um, you know, I think he was starting to get on a really good track there on saying how GuideStar is thinking about opening up their data or getting other open data involved with their initiatives. Sure, Jake. I, mean, I can talk a little bit, and I'll try to keep it brief. I know we're trying to keep things moving, but it, it is. It is changing how GuideStar is thinking about its data. You know, traditionally, one of the biggest barriers for us for opening up our data has been the fact that there is a significant cost to us for acquiring and digitizing our Forms 990 data. There's a significant cost involved for us acquiring new data sources and bringing them into our systems. And sustainability for us as a nonprofit means that those costs have to have this somehow be the offset by some foundation funding or revenue from products and services and data. And as a nonprofit, especially one that's been around for 16 years, the track record for us proves that along sustainability, foundation money starts to wane. They look for sustainability. And so as we look at how we want to open our data so we can make it available for more people to use, because that is ultimately the way data can be used to make a difference in the world, we have to do it in a sustainable way. We have to figure out how we can both open up the data as wide as possible, but still have a platform that we can use to do it in a sustainable manner. And that's the difficult challenge we have moving forward. Data kind, and I think this work has opened up the fact that we want to do it, and now it's a question of how. Great. And Jake, just another example oh, yeah. from a, from, sure. sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, no, just another sort of example from the CKW angle. What's been interesting is, Nonprofits that have actually come to us 
to survey the farmers that we're reaching, because this is a population that nobody can really get access to. So organizations like the World Food Program and a bunch of other NGOs who want to start serving this population have come to us, have actually hired us to do sort of market surveys on this population so they can better design programs um, and intervention at efforts. Great. Alistair, I'll leave it to you uh, to tell us if we have time for more questions or if we should leave it there. Um, Alistair, do you know if we should go with one more or move to the next speaker? Uh, yeah, let's take one more brief question. Uh, I know you get some questions around data granularity and the ability to drill down uh, and how far yeah. these, how predictive these models become. So maybe address that for a minute and then we'll move on. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So there are two questions sort of about what level of detail you're able to answer questions at. So for HISOOC and DC Action, uh, they want to know, for example, could you project the likelihood of high school graduation for a particular elementary school or for um, Emily, you know, was there enough data to actually predict which specific CKWs would benefit from the bicycle? So I think the general question is, how deep can you get with the analysis with the, the data that you have now? Sure, Jake, this is Hesuk. Um That's a fantastic question because as most of you understand, you know, we had to clean up our data sets quite a bit to really get to the level, the neighborhood level and the cluster level that we really needed. Uh, EC is broken down by wards. Um, there's eight wards. But as we started doing some analysis, preliminary analysis, the ward level wasn't quite getting us the answers we needed because our philosophy was that, yes, depending on where you live, what school you go to, it does predict and has some correlating um, effect in your likelihood to graduate or not. So we needed to answer that question with more uh, neighborhood level data. So our data heroes really actually took as much as of our indicators as they could and took it down to that um, level of analysis, which was fantastic. They, in fact, went even deeper to do the high school and elementary school catchment areas. And so we would have never been able to do that without data heroes really pushing us to get to that uh, level of analysis. And similarly, on the CKW side, yeah, we are able to take it down and look at things like, you know, based on the poverty level of the CKW, does, does that correlate to a performance change? And in some districts we found actually that the poorer the CKW, the more effective they were at, at reaching out to farmers, um, probably because they want to augment, they're more um, in, uh, motivated to augment their income. And looking at, you know, looking at patterns between male and female um, CKWs, looking at things like do does a kind of information that the farmer consumes change over their tenure in the program? The more they interact with the CKW, are they asking deeper and different kinds of questions? So, um, yeah, so there's some really interesting stuff you can do. All right. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, really appreciate you spending some time with us today and, uh, you know, taking time out from the worthwhile work you're doing to spread the word. And, uh, Jake, as always, thanks for uh, being you, – you may say that you guys owe credit to everyone else, but if everyone else is the reagents, you guys are definitely the catalyst. So uh, love the work that DataKind is doing and keep doing it. We're going to hand things over to our next speaker, Lisa Green, who's going to talk to us about uh, crawling the web to keep it open. Lisa. Thanks, Alistair. Common Crawl uh, – is a nonprofit foundation and that builds and maintains an open crawl of the web that's accessible to everyone. The web is the largest collection of information in human history. I've tried more than once to make a graphic that illustrates the difference between, say, the amount of information in a book or a library and the amount of information on the web, but I just can't get one that shows it as well as these numbers. But imagine the amount of information available to previous cultures, say, in the era of monks copying illustrated manuscripts by hand, or even in 1969 when NASA computer storage was measured in kilobytes. Clearly, the web is an astronomical amount, in data, of, amount of data in comparison. And the web, in many ways, is a copy of our world in ones and zeros, so we can analyze it better than the physical world. So the web provides an immensely rich corpus for research in all areas, for technological development, and for innovative new businesses, but only if it's open. 
If only a limited set of people have access to this tremendous store of data, something is broken. Previously, only a few large search companies had access to web crawl data. Our mission is to create an open crawl, one that is accessible to everyone. This is particularly important right now with a lot of things that are being rules, regulations, normative standards that are being developed around data and the web. The open source movement is on solid ground, but openness in the data world, in fact, the openness of the web itself is by no means guaranteed. And if we do it right now, we set the groundwork for the future. If we ensure the openness of the web now, we work toward ensuring it for future generations. But there are walls being built around data. There are walls being built due to the cost of collecting and maintaining the data. I mean, individuals and small groups face a huge cost barrier to maintaining large data sets, which is why it's important to build data commons. So those cost barriers, those are built in a passive fashion. It's just a fact that building and maintaining numerous private data sets is more expensive than working together to maintain a common data set. But there are people who are actively trying to build walls around data. These are political and legal walls being promoted by people who are bent on clinging to outdated business models in which limited access gives economic advantage to people who can assert rights over data. So like Rufus said, which I do think is the most tweetable quote of today's string of great presentations, uh, you build on data, you don't sell it. But there are people who don't see that, and they are working to build these legal and political walls around data. And uh, of course, some data will be private, but there are some types of data that belong in the commons, and web data is one. The web is not owned by anyone, and access to data about the commons must be open. If we let these walls be built around private gardens of data now, we'll have a lot more work in the future to tear them down. So Common Crawl was formed with the mission of ensuring a truly open web, and one of the ways we work towards this is by lowering the economic barrier to building and maintaining a large repository of crawl data. We have about 5 billion web pages right now. They're in an ARC file format, and they live on the Amazon Web Services public data sets. These files are available to anyone. We have recent crawl data that we're about to update to the AWS public data set bucket. And in the second half of 2012, we plan to offer specialized subset crawls that are updated with a high frequency. If you want some guidance on how to make use of these ARC files, we have, uh, there are several tutorials you can find. Like this one is called MapReduce for the Masses, Zero to Hadoop in Five Minutes with Common Crawl. You can find that on our blog. There's one by Pete Warden called 12 Steps to Running Your Ruby Code Across 5 Billion Web Pages. Pete's the uh, founder and CTO of Jetpack and one of our advisors, I'm very happy to say. And you can find a lot of useful code on our GitHub account. We're an open source project, so you can find our source code there. But you can also find some useful code for working with the data there. So we build and maintain this corpus so that anyone can use it, but we do have some users in mind. We're particularly interested in working with academia, academic researchers and academic educators. One example of this is a joint project from two universities in Germany, and they called the Web Data Commons, and they looked at adoption of microformats over time, by domain, by geography. Whether or not you're interested in microformats, you can imagine analogous studies of the web that could be done with a similar approach. Maybe looking at word count distributions of key phrases relevant to economic indicators or political issues. How about a, something, a study on how much can you trust HTTP headers? It's extremely common that the response headers provided with the web page are contradictory to the actual page. Things like what language it's in or the byte encoding. Browsers use these headers as hints, but need to examine the actual content to make a decision about what the content is. And it'd be interesting to understand how often those two contradict. Or you could train a classifier to identify topicality, extract meta keywords from the common crawl data, HTML data, then construct a training corpus of topically tagged documents to train a text classifier for a news application. 
you can see why it's important that this data be open so that anyone could do such a study, not just people on the Googleplex. Uh, we are also working to create open educational, oh, uh, my apologies for the formatting on that slide. Um, we're working with educators to develop open educational resources around the common call data. We all know about the impending shortage of people trained in big data techniques and data scientists, data wranglers. And it's important that the next generation of college students to come out of school comes out with experience in those techniques. And the Common Crawl data provides a large corpus of real world data for students to train on. We're working with a professor at the University of Maryland, though the logo was not supposed to make it onto the slide, and with a professor at MIT, and we're actively seeking more partners in this project to develop course material using Common Crawl data that they would be openly licensed as an OER, an open educational resource, so then we can push that out to colleges and universities across the English-speaking world. We're also very excited about the School of Data from Open Knowledge Foundation and P2P University. That, as Rufus said, is kicking off this month, and things are going to start to be happening in June and July, and we're very excited to participate in that. And of course, there are business applications for these data sets. The data is available to anyone, including commercial businesses. Having an open repository of crawl data lowers the barrier of entry for new businesses, which leads to economic diversity and technological advances. That's Common Crawl in a nutshell. I hope this brief presentation has given you some understanding of why we are so passionate about our mission of building and maintaining an open repository of web crawl data and our vision of a truly open web. If you'd like to learn more, please see our website. We have a discussion group that's a great place for interacting with the community. Our data lives on AWS public data sets, and I encourage you to go and play around with it. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email me. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. Um, so quick question for me. Um, what would you say is the most surprising use of common call data that you've encountered since you've been doing this? Um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I would have to say, um, yeah, I actually I don't have a good answer for that because everything has been fairly, you know, microformat study was really interesting. Some of the things that I've been looking at political phrases and how uh, keywords are grouped around political figures and how they're grouped with certain blogs, those were all anticipated. I haven't seen anything really shocking. I haven't seen anything really frivolous. But we are having a code contest that's launching uh, at the end of this month, and hopefully we'll have we'll see a wider variety of applications, and we'll have some surprising things then. All right, cool. Thank you very much. Well, um, it sounds like, as with everyone else on this call, you're doing great things, and we really appreciate you uh, taking some time to tell us about those. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to bring up our last speaker, Diedrich Van Leer, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Diedrich, uh, is going to join us from the Wikimedia Foundation where he's been doing all sorts of interesting things, and he's going to talk to us about liberating data at Wikipedia. Diedrich. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I'm very excited uh, today to talk about analytics at Wikipedia. Um, I want to share with you some of the recent developments that we are making at the Foundation in the area of data. And my goal is primarily to pique your interest and make you aware of some of the, the data sets that we are publishing right now that might not be on your radar, and some of the tools uh, and our thinking regarding tools that we are working on. Um, obviously, I cannot survey the entire ecosystem uh, that is built around Wikipedia because it's just gigantic. Um, but I do think that we have some cool things uh, uh, brewing in the kitchen, and I do want to give you a peek uh, of our kitchen. Um, some of these things are also plans or IDs, and uh, in that sense, uh, things can change, right? It's the nature of software development, uh, things change. So starting with um, Wikipedia, oh, sorry. Starting with uh, the foundation, um, we are the custodian of all the Wikimedia and Wikipedia projects. Um, and that means that uh, we have uh, just the, just the Wikipedia is in 280 lang 283 languages. Um, we have every um, month about uh, 8,000 new articles being written by our community. Uh, the, the number of edits is about 20 million per month. Um, 
we have we are close to reaching 500 million unique visitors every single month, and uh, in the last half a year, we are about uh, uh, closing to 20, 20 billion page views. And those uh, of those 20 billion, um, we are now already getting 2 billion on our mobile devices. So uh, we are basically swimming in data. There's so much data that it, uh, it's just uh, a very privileged position to be in and to be able to uh, use that data for the greater good. Uh, because I believe that we are positioned at a very unique intersection. We are the number five destination on the web. Um, we are just right behind uh, Google and Facebook and the other big ones in terms of visitors. Um, but we are, all, we are open all the way down, right? Um, our intellectual stack is based, on, based upon open, share, and attribute. And as you know, uh, this is our, how our communities operate. Um, that's also how the foundation operates. This is our DNA. Uh, and these um, open, share, and attribute are our aspirational goals. I always think that we can do a better job, that we should uh, try harder to reach them. I don't think we'll ever reach them, but they are our aspirational goals. And uh, we are doing, I think, a really good job in uh, making our content open. And when I talk about content, I just mean the articles. Um, our software, the Media Wiki platform, is open source, so we're doing a good job over there. But I think we can do a better job when it comes to, to data. And so that's uh, what I see as the role of the analytics team is to liberate data, to make sure that it's not just us, the foundation people, have access to the data, but that um, everybody who has an interest in the data, uh, and we make sure it is uh, sanitized and it is anonymized, uh, can, can have access to the data as well. Um, so we always will uh, respect the, the privacy of our readers and editors. Uh, but we do want to develop the tools and APIs so people can use our data in new and innovative ways. And so when I'm talking about data, um, I'm referring uh, basically to article data. That's the data that you, that you read uh, on the Wikipedia uh, website. Uh, it's the data that our editors uh, uh, edit, what, what, what they edit, when they edit. It's the reader data. Uh, it's the search data. What are people searching for? What can they not find? What can they find? And it's the device data. So these are they're like massive themes of, of data. Uh, and these are all, uh, I just kind of bundle them together and when I say data. Um, and I think, we, uh, I think we should challenge ourselves. And I think we should become more open. And particularly, we should become more uh, machine readable. Uh, if we are, are allowing ourselves to become more machine readable, then we will allow other people to mash up, to reuse, to annotate these data sources and come up with new applications. Because we just know that there's no way that just the, the small foundation can do all the analysis of, of these, these data sources, right? We are just too small. We have too few resources to do it ourselves. So we need to crowdsource our analytics efforts. We need to invite all data-minded people uh, to help us and uh, find those nuggets of insight that are buried in our data and, uh, and join us uh, in, in exposing that. Um, and I think um, because uh, we uh, value privacy so much, that actually is a, um, so we constrain ourselves in, the, in what we track and what we do with, uh, with the data. And those self-imposed constraints, I believe, will actually lead us to come with more enough the solutions that on the one hand will respect privacy, uh, and on the other hand, uh, will still uh, give us those nuggets of insight that we're looking for. And I think that's a very uh, interesting uh, challenge that we are facing. Um, next slide. Um, there are other projects that, um, oh, sorry. There are other projects that um, are not as well known as Wikipedia, but that should, uh, at least briefly be mentioned because there are, are, are cool things going on. And so these uh, are, for example, um, it's MediaWiki. It's the, that's the wiki software that is running on Wikipedia. But we have Wikispecies, which is a, uh, 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 a site that's focusing on more biological data. We have Wikiversity, which is used uh, for educational purposes. Uh, we have Commons. Commons is becoming extremely important. It's, the, it's an uh, open. Uh, library of, of media, and uh, there's a lot of high quality uh, photos and videos are available there. And so there's a whole um, 
a bunch of projects that are that may not be on your radar yet, but that are part of our uh, of our mission uh, to to help build out. And so one of the um, amazing things of Wikipedia projects is that we uh, they create a digital footprint of the people worldwide and really worldwide. As I mentioned, there are about 280. Uh, different languages, uh, even languages that are not even spoken anymore. Um, so we have a truly global uh, reach, and uh, that's uh, unique. Uh, and I think uh, uh, how our communities, on a day-by-day -day basis, how they uh, make sense of what's going on in the world, how they uh, come up with uh, new articles, uh, debate what is happening, trying to give um, uh, interpretation to what is happening, always to reference everything they say, um, a very strong focus on, on quality and making sure that uh, everything is, is being backed, a uh, neutral point of view, and uh, that's really, uh, these are core qualities of our communities and, and together uh, it creates this digital footprint of people and I think that uh, just like Twitter is, is this stream of conscious, um, Wikipedia is this stream of knowledge. And uh, which is localized and which is uh, culture specific, and I think uh, there's so much hidden in there. So right now, it's the case that Wikipedia is primarily a destination, right? You go to Wikipedia, and you uh, you you search for a particular uh, information. You read an article. You might click some other articles, and then you leave. But it's really a destination, and. Uh, what we are seeing right now, and I'm very excited about it, is that um, it's slowly evolving into an ecosystem. And this ecosystem uh, contains of um, data consumers and uh, data applications and uh, reusing our data. And I'll just give a quick couple of examples, and this is by no means to be um, uh, uh, covering all the use cases, but there, there are some things going on. So. Obviously, just um, you can access our data through an API. You can query uh, data. You can monitor pages, and you can get the data back in a JSON format or an XML format or any other format. That's really just one thing. Um, we have been working together with with, with Rufus uh, of Seekan, who has been talking today as well, um, on publishing our data sets, uh, our, our smaller data sets on uh, on Seekan, and we are very excited about that. Then there's uh, a, uh, an independent project called DBpedia, which takes our content and adds a lot of meta information. They add more structure to the, to the data. Um, and basically, it's like this Web 3.0 uh, project. So with this new metadata, machines can start to reason uh, uh, and can start to ask queries. So for example, uh, in just pure Wikipedia website, it's very hard to say, give me all the capitals of all the cities in the world, because Wikipedia does not understand the concept of a capital, for example. But DB, DBpedia contains this meta information of, of capitals. So in DBpedia, you can actually uh, start asking those questions. So these are, things are um, already out there and exist. And there are just two things I think I should mention that are, are, are going to happen right now. The first one is called Wikidata. And Wikidata is a project um, launched by the German uh, Wikipedia chapter, and it is uh, primarily focused on adding this metadata, this structure, to the info boxes on our articles. And as you probably know, uh, most of our uh, articles contain, uh, in the upper right corner, an info box. For example, if you read an article about an author, it might say the date it was, he, was, he or she was born, he or she passed away, uh, the place it was born, all these kind of uh, let's say small facts. And so Wikidata, what it will do, it will uh, be a central repository for all these kinds of data in those info boxes. So we will standardize the information across our different Wikipedias. And this is all going to be in um, Web 3.0 technologies uh, uh, being able to export. So this is a really cool project. Uh, they just started about six weeks ago uh, writing the code. Um, and I'm very excited about this project, and I definitely uh, would urge you to keep an eye on this because this could really change Wikipedia. The second one is called OAuth, and this is also really something I believe is going to change how we can interact with Wikipedia. OAuth is simply said is a way to um, for a third-party app to impersonate as you uh, without actually getting access 
access to your credentials, to your username or password, but can act on your behalf on the website. So we all know, for example, the Facebook login. Um, uh, that kind of technology we want to uh, enable uh, on Wikipedia. So this will allow third-party developers to start developing new applications, for example, a new editor interface or a new visualization interface on our, uh, with our data. So I'm very uh, excited about OAuth as well. And that's on the, it's been put on the roadmap uh, for coming year. And um, I would definitely urge you as well to keep an eye on that because that uh, will really uh, spur the, the rate of innovation in this ecosystem of applications. So that is um, quickly surveying what, what is the current state of what we're looking ahead. Um, oh, uh, sorry. Um, but there's more data that we want to liberate. And, uh, and to that extent, uh, we started, the Wikimedia Foundation started a um, Um, analytics team, and I'm the product manager of analytics, um, and right now it's, we are a small team. We are uh, three people. It's me and two engineers, full-time engineers, fortunately. We are hiring a third one, but we do want to um, uh, deliver a, a big punch. And primarily, um, so we've been starting since last December, and surprisingly, maybe for people who don't know, know Wikimedia so well, um, uh, but so recently, we were really uh, small and didn't have much resources. So the current state is that, is that we uh, don't have much yet, but our plans are big. So we are hopefully moving away from this uh, paper dashboard to a real digital dashboard. And one of the, the big projects that we're working on right now is called Kraken. And Kraken is, um, our, is, the, is, the, is, our, is the code name for our platform which is a self-servicing data platform that will allow uh, people first within the foundation, but it's definitely our goal outside the foundation as well, to query our reader, article, and device-related data. Um, and so we are building this uh, a cluster. It's going to be about 30 nodes. Um, and uh, I can go into more details if people want that uh, about the stack. But it will uh, start collecting data uh, on uh, on the, on the readers, uh, we will anonymize, obviously, all our data. Uh, but we do want to be able to uh, start querying. And so this is the, the biggest uh, project that we are currently working on. Um, I think uh, that uh, by, let's say, September, we will be able to have a, like a very first uh, prototype of it. Uh, but this is definitely, uh, once we have this up and running, there will, will be a, a public API, and then uh, we can really start crowdsourcing the analysis part of our data. That's a little bit in the future. Um, the, um, the other uh, two projects that uh, are currently, uh, these are more some, some uh, background on the slide. Um, the other two projects that uh, we are currently having uh, is called Wiki Hadoop. And um, as you know, uh, Hadoop is this amazing uh, open source uh, uh, system that allows you to distribute your analysis uh, of data. Um, we uh, publish every month uh, XML files of all our content. And so, for example, the English Wikipedia contains about, uh, it's about five terabytes of data that you can download. And it's, it's like these massive XML documents. Um, Hadoop by itself has a very simple support for XML documents. So uh, out of the box Hadoop, you cannot uh, analyze our XML files. Um, so that's why we developed Wiki Hadoop. And Wiki Hadoop uh, basically uh, makes it possible to uh, analyze the compressed XML files uh, on the fly. Um, and, uh, do, um, and can, for example, uh, create uh, the difference between two revisions, and revision is basically a version of the article. Um, this means that uh, now with, uh, you can just uh, fire up an instance on Amazon cluster uh, and start crunching our XML data. And one of the uh, uh, applications of this data is that uh, we call it the, uh, the RevDiff search, and that allows you to import the output of Wiki Hadoop. This creates a full search text engine on 
uh, the contents being added and being removed. And now you can start adding, asking really interesting questions, like, for example, uh, which authors are adding geo templates? Which authors are removing content? Who's adding citations? Or previously, that was extremely hard or maybe close to impossible to do. Um, but with uh, Wikihadoop and uh, Reflective Search, that is, uh, these tools allow you to really start making use of our XML files. Um, to quickly give you uh, some links, because obviously uh, that uh, people want to know where to find uh, the stuff. Um, a lot of uh, the Wikihadoop and the Reflective Search are on GitHub. Um, um, the Kraken, uh, right now we are working on a front end that is uh, also on GitHub, and you can see uh, our uh, current report cards, uh, which is a visualization of the current statistics uh, in our labs environment, and labs environment is an uh, environment where we kind of experiment with new applications. Um, the data sets that I mentioned, uh, for example, the XML files are all on uh, dumps. That, we um, that it contains the page view data, it contains survey data, and it contains XML dumps. And the, um, uh, some of the data sets are also being published on the on datahub.io. Uh, and it's probably best just to, to search for Wikimedia. And then uh, you will find a lot of data sets that uh, contain really interesting information. Um, so that's. Uh, that's about it uh, for me from right now. Uh, we are liberating data at Wikipedia, and uh, we would love to hear if there are particular f sources of information that you think we should be working on and liberating. Uh, I cannot promise that we will fulfill every single request, uh, but I do want to uh, know what people are thinking that we should be working on, because in the end, uh, I think the analytics team should be servicing the community. And so uh, please uh, do get in touch uh, with us. Um, you can reach me, and uh, I'm a, I will always look a, try to uh, accommodate your requests. So um, thanks for listening. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Didrik. Uh, so uh, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, one person says that, you know, Kraken and so on look like meta projects, um, but uh, do you have any projects going on for the local, little, or dying language people? Um, do you have any data on indigenous peoples and so on? Um, um, well, we, we all the uh, all the projects, um, the Wikipedia and all the other projects in every language, all the data is exposed in those XML files. So um, that's one source to look at. Uh, for example, you can see how active an indigenous language project is, and that could be an indicator of uh, of their health. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what your question is. Yeah, your um, point is that the tools work for any particular language, and in yes. fact, those tools can be used to compare activity across languages as well. Definitely, yes. Okay, cool. Um, one question, uh, one other question. Uh, some of these tools sound like they'd be great ways to stop spam. You know, if, you, if you're concerned that someone is doing something nefarious or, or changing things so much, how tied is the open tool set and, and letting people police the system independently to uh, Wikipedia's mission of trying to make sure that the data is accurate and the people aren't gaming it and so on. How tightly are those two linked? So we know from research that um, um, spam or any other, uh, let's say, uh, uh, non-constructive non uh, content uh, is removed within two minutes. And so that's our community. That's the power of our community that monitors on a 24-7 basis what is being added and, um, uh, and makes sure that if things are incorrect or, uh, or spam or even worse than that uh, is removed. And that is um, a largely a hand job still, surprisingly. Um, they do uh, monitor uh, changes. Uh, that's how, how they keep track of it. Um, we don't actually use so far any automated way to detect uh, to detect spam, as far as I know. I could be missing a, a project because, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of stuff happening, but I'm not aware of any automated efforts in that area. So you'll do things like uh, is there automation on like locking if something's thrashing too much? It'll sort of have a cooldown period, or is it entirely manual? So I was referring to the actual I was referring to the actual content um, of the. Um, of the, uh, of the Wikipedia site. Sure. Um, in case of um, 
uh, our Kraken uh, cluster, then we will definitely uh, start start doing automated spam detection. But that's more something that we need to think about at the, at the moment because that's something that is not on our short uh, roadmap. So Kraken is a platform that could be used for those kinds of goals? Yes, definitely. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for spending some time with us today, and uh, thank you to all the speakers here. Uh, we're a little over time, so I want to make good use of the remaining few minutes, but I thank you all for joining us. Some really inspiring stories, and I've got to say, you know, my, I'm blown away by the amount of people that are working on good things to keep data open and, and affect social change in concrete ways. So uh, thank you all, not just for being here, for, but for working on stuff that matters. Uh, I'm going to hand things over to Yasmina for a few closing remarks. Thank you very much, Alistair. Folks that attended today, we thank you so much for attending our event and I hope you benefited from it. Thank you to Alistair for organizing an amazing online conference. A big thank you to all our speakers. And folks, we'd like to really say a big thank you to our sponsor, EMC. EMC offers a comprehensive big data solution that includes market-leading scale-out storage, a unified analytics platform, as well as business process and application development tools. These technologies, along with EMC strategy and technical services, enable organizations to use their big data to achieve new levels of efficiency, agility, and business breakthroughs. Thank you, EMC. Again, thank you, Alistair. Thank you to all of our speakers. This will conclude today's online conference. Goodbye, everybody.